Well, the average existence, as we said, is, demarca is a demarcation between um, the aristocracy and the minority. The average existence is understood as the masses or the middle class. Um, and the standard of living, and we all know what that is, was at the time better than our current standard of living. But he also says that there were ages and he calls them epochs, right? There were um, epochs in which the average existence was the same, right? This is the same average existence, sort of theoretically speaking, as this. This average existence was worse than this. So what he says is that with the passage of time, um, in relationship to this idea of historical leveling, that it fluctuates, right? There are going to be eras, there are going to be epochs in which the average existence is has been better than our time com uh, currently. There will be epochs in which the average existence is the same as our time. There will be epochs in which the average existence was worse than our time. So this would be um, sort of an idea of how this works. So for example, um, the economic boom of the 1980s was a better average existence than the Great Depression, right? The economic boom of the 1980s um, might not have been, oh, might have been um, similar to the average existence um, in 2000, some might argue. I doubt that, but some might argue that. And the economic boom of the 1980s might not have been as good as the average um, existence at the turn of the... Um, turn of the change with respect to um, scientific enlightenment, right? So that scientific enlightenment made the average existence that much better because now we weren't thinking that, you know, maggots were a product of garbage. We start to recognize spontaneous generation isn't true. We start to recognize that um, celestial bodies have imperfections, gravity, you know, and so on and so on and so forth. So the average existence might have been higher then than it is now. But you have an idea, right? What he's doing is he's situating the discussion historically. Why does this matter? Why should anyone care about this, right? Well, you should care about this uh, for a number of reasons. One, the first reason is, is that in doing any historical analysis, um, and you don't have to be a historian, I mean, I'm trained as a philosopher, but um, in doing any historical analysis, you have to immediately recognize that insofar as we discuss history, if we're talking about war, if we're talking about peace, if we're talking about conflict, if we're talking about politics, if we're talking about anything, you're always doing a comparative analysis. How does our time favor to some other time? How does our time favor to a time that was similar to our time? How does our time favor to, um, compare to a time that was worse than our time? And so on, right? Uh, as the old adage says, we need to make sure that we have an understanding of history so that we don't make uh, similar mistakes from the past. So that's one advantage that we have. Um, and his, um, what Gassette does in this chapter is he says that this is sort of the account, the accurate account of our time, right? The height of the time, which is the title uh, of the chapter. What he's going to do is he's going to say that this is one model. So this is one model of um, the height of the time. Um, the next thing to recognize is that there can be a different, there can be a different conception, right? And this conception uh, is represented in the following, and I'll actually read, uh, and then we'll do an analysis of it. Um, he says the following. Um, not everyone agrees with the first account that I, that I gave, this fluctuating account of the height of our time. He says in the following, he says, um, the majority of historical periods did not look upon their own time, their own time, as superior to preceding times, right? My time, the height of our time, is at a higher level than other times. He says the majority of historical periods don't do that. On the contrary, the most usual thing has been for men to dream of better times. The most usual thing, the most common thing that happens is that men dream of a better time. In a vague past of fuller existence of a golden age, right? And he has golden age in quotes. And what we're going to do, what I'm going to do in this next part, is to give an account, both a visual and um, an analytical account, of what Gisset means by the Golden Age, because it becomes very important later in the uh, analysis. So it's important that you understand what the Golden Age is. Um, as they looked back and visualized those epics, and remember the epics are the little lines, right, that, I, that demarcate one average existence from another. As they looked back and visualized those epics of great worth, they had the feeling not of dominating them, but, on the contrary, of falling below them. Okay, what 
in the world does that mean? What does what does uh, Gesset mean by that? Well, the first account that we said with respect to the passage of time and historical leveling was that there is a fluctuation between um, the various epics, right? As the passage of time increases, the epics fluctuate. You'll have an average existence that's higher, then it'll be lower, then it'll be higher, then it'll be the same, then it'll be lower, and so on. Anytime you hear someone talk about um, the good old days, right? Back in the good old days or the golden age, um, this can be visualized, right? The golden age argument or the sort of nostalgic argument, the argument from nostalgia, looks like this. This is a previous time, 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 and unfortunately, here's our time, right? When you're talking about um, the golden age or back in my day, in the good old days, you know, all these um, sort of old adages, all these sayings that look in the past with a, a fond reminder, what Gasset says is, this is actually most current, right? This is, um, this is what happens most frequently, rather. And this is what's most frequent. In the good old days, um, sort of nostalgic longing for the past, I recognize that this is our time here, and this was the time of my, um, the generation before me, and my grandfather's generation, and my great-grandparents' generation, and so on, right? So that I have a longing for the past, right? So that what I'm doing is I'm comparing our average existence here, and I'm saying, look how debased we are. Look how bad we are. Look at, look at how much poorer we are, how much, violent, how much more violent our societies, how less money we have. Um, look at where we are compared to the good old days, right? So that what this, this idea of nostalgia, this idea of the golden age, anytime someone evokes the golden age or, or um, you know, days longing of the past, in your mind, you can immediately pull up this image, right, from Gisset. And you can visually see sort of what they're saying, right? And not only can you visually see what it is they're saying, it'll help you in formalizing arguments that can either support or critique that, that view. And what happens is you can imagine a ball bouncing down a stair, boom, 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 right? Things have progressively gotten worse, right? Things have progressively become more debased. We have this, 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 um, this lack, right? This um, diminishing sense of value with respect to um, each of these epics. The line would rep represent an epic, right? Each of these epics um, is diminishing. And what he says is that what I do here, what we do here, is that we are constantly looking back, right? So this is um, what would be classified as a past-oriented, not a future-oriented. This would be um, cat cat um, cat characterized. Sorry, this would be characterized as a past-oriented. Um, historical view, right? A past-oriented historical view. My historical view, my understanding, which I get from history, is past-oriented. The good old days, the golden age. I look back. Um, obviously, you can see how this attempt to perpetually be fixed on the past impedes future progress, right? It's an impediment. It becomes a huge impediment because what you're doing at all times is you're gazed in the past, your, your, your focus, instead of being on tomorrow, instead of being on the future, instead of being on what is in store, you're thinking about here, right, in 21st century, 19, uh, uh, 21st century, uh, 2000, let's say 1990s, 1980s, 1970s, 1960s, 1950s, the good old days, right, the good old days. Um, this idea is um, sort of this relic of the past, right, you've, you've, um, you've, uh, you've looked back in the past with such longing, with such n nostalgia, with such reverence that you become fixed, right? That you become fixed. And if I were a director, um, sort of visually um, attempting to depict this in a movie, it's the old house, right, that has now um, become the haunted house. And there might be an old man, an old woman, an old couple that lives in this old house, and it's it's like covered in a in a thick layer of just just dirt that is collected on all these old objects, right? 
and they're stuck in the 